Hungarians, and, you know, in the 1950s, or the people fleeing, you know, the collapse of South Vietnam in the 1970s and 80s. They were welcomed a lot more generously because they were interpreted under the lens of, you know, people fleeing communism. And today, obviously, there's a whole different set of politics at work. Today, since 1951, the definition doesn't really apply to Afghans who are just escaping a country because of the war or because of famine that's happening as a result of the collapse of the country's government. And of course, it doesn't apply to people who are displaced by climate change or other ecological catastrophes. And it's really it's really a category, this distinction between real refugees and economic migrants, it's really a category that the, the West, you know, imposes on people and that they then try to have to fit themselves to rather than any existing that distinction that's out there in the world. And one of the things I write about in the book is the way that migrants, refugees, have to navigate these legal systems. I'm Bryce Klen, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, Friday, February 25th, 2022. I sat down with Matthew Akins, a Canadian journalist and the author of the new book, The Naked Don't Fear the Water, an undercover journey with Afghan refugees. The book details Matthew's undercover journey from Afghanistan to Europe. He made the trip with his translator, Omar, who had been denied a special immigrant visa despite having been a translator for coalition forces in Afghanistan. Following his visa denial, Omar decided to flee as a refugee. Matthew decided to join him for the journey. We talked about a range of topics, including Matthew and Omar's journey, and the politics of migration in Europe. It's the Lawfare Podcast, February 25th, Matthew Akins on traveling as an Afghan refugee. Matthew, why did you write this book? I wrote this book because I had lived in Afghanistan for a long time working as a reporter, and I had seen the devastation that these wars had inflicted, you know, not just in Afghanistan, but in, in Syria and the Middle East and elsewhere. And the journey of refugees to seek refuge um, in the West is really a way to connect these stories to, you know, people in my own country in the States and in Canada. And so Omar's journey, the journey that we made together, in essence, is a way to connect the Afghan war to our own lives. So let's talk about your relationship with Omar. When did you first meet him and why did you decide to take this journey with him? I met Omar in 2009. He was a former U.S. military interpreter, um, an Afghan, who had decided to work, start working with journalists. I was sort of at the beginning of my career as well. So we started working together, doing investigations in Afghanistan, and became friends as well. I got to know his whole family. And, you know, he wanted to get out. He didn't see a future in the country, given what was happening as the war got worse. He had applied for one of these uh, special immigrant visas that the U.S. gives to former employees in Iraq and Afghanistan, but he didn't have enough paperwork. And eventually, even though I was trying to help him with his application, he got rejected. So this was in 2000, the end of 2015, when the migration crisis was happening in Europe and the Mediterranean, all those little boats were crossing. And he was like, well, this is my chance to go. I'm going to take the smuggler's road to Europe. And I was like, well, if you're going to do that, then I want to go with you and write about the journey. But the only way that I could do that was to go undercover as an Afghan refugee myself, which I was able to do because I speak Persian and I, I look Afghan. So you're originally from Canada, is that correct? Yeah, my mother is from the US. My father's from Canada. I grew up in Canada. But her side of the family is Japanese American. My great grandparents came over from Japan at the beginning of the 20th century. And they were actually interned in the camps during World War II. So there was sort of a personal aspect to ending up in these refugee camps and seeing the way people were caged behind bar barbed wire and, and the hatred they faced in many cases uh, that resonated with me and that I talk about a bit in the book. So let's talk about 2015, sort of where you, where you open the book when you when Omar decides that he has to leave Afghanistan and is taking the smuggler's road, I want you to just explain for a second what was happening in terms of the war in Afghanistan at that point that made Omar decide that. And also what was happening, you touched on it a bit earlier, but what was happening in terms of 
migration politics more broadly in Europe? So in 2015, you had uh, a large volume of people who started to cross the Mediterranean into Europe. They'd always, you know, they've been going over the years, uh, particularly people from Iraq and Syria. But these populations uh, had been building up in Turkey mostly, a lot of Syrians displaced by the war. And at the same time, in Afghanistan, you had the end of the U.S. combat mission, you had the beginning of the U.S. troop withdrawal, a decline in foreign spending. So that led to an economic downturn that was really severe uh, and that pushed a lot of Afghans to go, as well as deteriorating uh, security picture. You know, the Taliban were making advances in the provinces and there was more violence in Kabul. So you had more internal displacement and you had more Afghans also going abroad, taking the smuggler's road through Iran, through Pakistan, ending up in Turkey. So you have this population building up in Turkey. And in 2015, the dam kind of breaks. People just start crossing the Med in little rubber boats, landing on the Greek islands. And there's just so many of them that there's really no way for the authorities to do anything but let them go onward to Athens. And then from there, they're moving up through the Balkans. And it's a, it's a mass migration. It was the greatest uh, movement of refugees by sea in history. You know, almost a million people crossed the Med that year. So you, there's no way to stop these people without, you know, shooting them. And these images of violence and, and chaos at the borders are, are, there's a public outcry. And the Europeans, led by Angela Merkel, decide to open a humanitarian corridor through the Balkans. They open the borders, in essence, which is something that's almost like a miracle, as I describe in my book, a suspension of the laws of nature, this border that had kept people out of Europe for so long is now open if you landed on the Greek islands, which was a dangerous journey by sea. But if you landed there, you could then move legally and safely. So a lot of um, families started going, you know, elderly, children, almost half the people crossing were children by the end, half the people who drowned were children. So that's the context that we the book begins in. But by the time we actually get going and get there, the borders slam shut again. And, and the Europeans introduced a new round of border policies and strategies to block out refugees and that's what we have to get across before we before we we dive into your your journey with omar i was wondering if you could describe omar's family and sort of the way that his upbringing really reflected the dependence in afghanistan on the the economy that that formed during the war yeah well to go back even further you know his parents fled the soviets as refugees. He was born in Pakistan. He and his siblings grew up uh, in exile in Pakistan and Iran. And then in 2001, after the US invaded and toppled the Taliban government, they were part of this huge movement of Afghan refugees who are the re largest refugee population in the world for like three decades. Millions of them returned, filled with hope for this new era of development and democracy in Afghanistan. Omar remembered seeing at the Torhun border crossing the white flag of the Taliban replaced by the tricolor of, you know, the, the king's time, the flag of the republic, and it filled him with hope. So he comes back from exile, like so many other Afghans, and the, the economy is almost entirely based on aid. The, the good jobs are with the foreigners. His mother, they don't come from a wealthy background, but his mother was a school teacher, and she really made an effort to get her kids educated. So they spoke English. They were well positioned to get jobs in this new aid economy. And for a young kid like Omar, who's got some guts, the best way to, to make some money uh, was to go to a place like Kandahar in the south where the war was starting to heat up again and the foreign soldiers were in need of interpreters. So he shows up, a kid on Kandahar airfield, quickly gets hired. And the next thing you know, he's like he's like wearing body armor, walking on foot patrol with the Canadians uh, who, who we went with first on the front lines of this war. So how did you link up with him after that? We met at the Mustafa Hotel in early 2009. And I had just come back to Afghanistan after a bit of an adventure in the borderlands in the south where I was hanging out with some drug traffickers and they introduced me to um, Colonel Abdul Razak, who was 
this border police commander and a key ally of the U.S. military and also involved with drug trafficking. So I was doing an investigation of that and I needed someone who would go with me to the South. But I was 24 years old, you know, at the start of my career, I got an assignment with Harper's Magazine, but the budget I had wasn't enough for, you know, the established fixers to, who were charging hundreds of dollars per day to go to the South. And if they're willing to go at all, but the hotel manager of this kind of strange flea bag hotel where a lot of people stayed in the early years, he introduced me to Omar because he knew that Omar was looking to get his start at working in journalism as well. So we both uh, went down together and that was the beginning of our, our long relationship. So Omar applies for the special immigrant visa that gets denied. He decides that he wants to go. But something that you really that you portray in the book is how some of his siblings were abroad. And that sort of persisted as a reminder of how how there was such a lack of opportunity in Afghanistan. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Sure. I mean, one of the things that I think is important to understand about Afghan migration is that it's it's kind of circular. You know, people go abroad, they come back, they they form diasporas, they form transnational communities, um, they have, you know, families have members spread out across the world. This is something that Af- Afghans have kind of adapted to, you know, after, as a result of 40 years of conflict in their country. And so Omar's siblings, you know, because again, they were, they were educated and they wanted, they saw that there was opportunities elsewhere. They saw that their country was one of the poorest in the world and was caught in this war that didn't seem to be ending. They wanted to emigrate. So one by one, they kind of found ways to go. You know, uh, some of the married other like Afghans who'd, who'd also already immigrated. You know, there's very few ways for an Afghan to move legally. You know, their passport is one of the worst in the world. I think it is the worst in the world right now when it comes to visa free, free travel. And that's deliberate. Countries want to keep out Afghans because they're able to claim asylum. You don't, no one wants asylum seekers. So there's a whole system that, that the West has designed that actually has its antecedents in measures designed to keep out Jews during the Nazi period. So there's this whole system of visas and laws that are intended to cage Afghans in their country. And for them to get out, just, you know, there's very few ways. One of them is marrying someone who's already in Europe. So a couple of his brothers do that. Student visas, then they start going, you know, illegally as they get more desperate because the war is getting worse. And at the moment, Omar is deciding to migrate. His parents are also trying to go. Uh, his remaining sister uh, is trying to go. And I end up also getting entangled in their their journeys as well. I want to take a step back from Omar's situation for a second to just sort of, I think it might seem strange to to our listeners that you decided to go undercover with Omar. I mean, what was that process like for you? mentally at great personal risk you're going to take this journey with him yeah i mean it was a tough decision partly because of the the difficulty of pulling it off i would have to speak persian you know with other afghans and without them noticing that i was a foreigner but also there was a lot of ethical considerations i mean it is a journey involving deception and breaking the law but it was the really the only possible way you could travel with someone because of the danger of kidnapping or if you got arrested as a you know as a westerner you'd be separated at the border so there was no other way to do the trip and i thought it was important to do and then there was also a personal component to it too which 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 again made it complicated because you know as i got deeper into the trip um the line that i t- tried to draw as an objective journalist began to blur as i became more committed to helping him and, and, and just helping our, ourselves in these yeah very dangerous situations that we found ourselves in dealing with smugglers, dealing with criminals. Um, but ultimately, it was something that I felt I'd been preparing my whole career for. I, you know, I lived in Afghanistan for years. I learned the language um, because of my Asian heritage and look Afghan. And uh, I just, I just decided that it was, it was important to do and then I could do it. Let's talk about the the journey now. What was the original plan? Sort of take us through geographically where you were planning on on going. Well, to go from Afghanistan to Europe, there are a number of possible routes. You know, in the book, I describe them as a network of lines connecting cities, where distance is measured not by you know physical mileage, but by the amount of risk involved, and the shortest trip with the least risk is is going to be the most expensive as well so if you for example want to um fly to istanbul with a visa you'd have to spend usually a few thousand dollars on that as an afghan because you'd have to essentially pay bribes to get a visa to fly to turkey and then from there you could you could go to europe 
or some people would fly to um, Tehran and then cross the Zagros Mountains with smugglers. But all of those options require a passport, which is not easy to get and expensive sometimes, so at least for, for, for poor Afghans. So the, the poorest go overland through the desert, through the, the Nimroz border, actually down into Pakistan and over into Iran. It's an extremely arduous trip. It goes through territory controlled by the insurgents and drug smuggling gangs. Um, there's a lot of violence. But it is the cheapest way, and you don't need any documents. And of course, Omar wanted to go the safest way, and I couldn't blame him for that. But as events turned out, that was not possible because of the Turkish, um, the attempted coup in Turkey. And so we ended up going to the border uh, in Nimroz. So let's, I'm skipping over uh, some stuff here, uh, but let's talk about your boat journey and sort of your your trip across the Mediterranean. What was that like? I mean, you put your life in the hands of of smugglers. What is that? First of all, what does that feel like? Let's start there about, you know, sort of paying a smuggler and, and putting your life in their hands. The smuggler is a complex figure. You know, he's sort of a villain for a lot of uh, Western politicians who want to blame the migrant crisis on the greed of smugglers. But in actuality, smugglers and, and border policies exist in a kind of symbiotic relationship. The more dangerous and difficult a border is to cross, the more a migrant is willing to pay a smuggler to uh, get them across it. So smugglers benefit from from border controls, and almost every refugee needs one to escape because, again, there's laws that criminalize the movement of people from war-torn poor countries across borders. And so you have to deal with smugglers, if you could find a good one, then then that's great. There's a lot of really bad ones as well. Ours, our experience is more mixed. We we got lied to, we got kind of um, cheated, but at the end of the day, we had to rely on them. So there's a sense of vertigo, you know, in handing yourself over to criminals because all the kind of recourse that we're used to growing up in a place like, you know, North America is that whether it's legal or, or moral or whatever, there's, there's none of that. You know, whatever happens to you is kind of on you. It's your fault, even for being in that situation in the first place. So the boat ride, um, this was a pretty crazy scene in the book. And it's one I think that is worth worth diving into right now. You pay the smuggler, you get in this inflatable boat, if I have that right. And there isn't sort of like, you know, an employee of the smuggler driving the boat, right? He has somebody with you you know one of the people in your party was driving the boat is that right yeah the boats make a one-way trip so the smugglers just appoint a refugee uh, to drive the boat sort of just point at the lights because you can actually see the crossings are usually made at night but you can see the lights of lesvos in the distance and so it's not not that complicated and it's not that long of a journey, maybe five miles, depending. But it's a lot can go wrong, you know, at night in the waves. Mo- most of the people on the boat had never seen the ocean before, never been in a boat. Omar had never been in a boat at sea. You know, I grew up on the ocean and, uh, you know, I'm a strong swimmer. So it was definitely a very different experience for me. But, of course, I found it quite concerning to be out there. And, and I knew that if, if the boat, for example, lost air, uh, like they often do, that people would start drowning really quickly. Explain uh, to our listeners where you were trying to go. You were trying. You were in Turkey, and you were trying to go to Lesbos, Greece. Is that right? Well, no, we were trying not to go to Lesbos because that was this the location of this notorious camp called Moria. So there's several different islands that you could go to. By that point, the Greek authorities, really, you know, made to do so by the EU, had turn the islands into open air prisons in essence. Uh, refugees, migrants, asylum seekers who landed on them weren't allowed to carry onward, uh, not without you know going through a very long process. And so so we knew we'd get stuck on the on the islands, have to find a way off, but the worst place to be stuck for sure was Moria, the largest, most notorious camp in Europe that just burned to the ground a week before after a riot there. So we had asked the smuggler not to send us to Lesbos, not to send us to Moria. He had promised not to, and he had li- he lied to us. And, um, and you know, Omar was actually forced when he protested; was actually forced at gunpoint to to get down in the van and get in the boat. So we had no choice uh, but to go to Moria, even though we didn't intend to. Uh, 
you you talk about in the book you know the the maritime boundaries that you were trying to to get out of when you're on this boat journey walk us through you know what you were trying to do there yeah so at this point in time in 2016 there had been a huge response to the spectacle of people crossing the sea in little riverboats and drowning bodies like that of Aylan Kurdi, you know, this uh, Syrian Kurdish boy washing up on the beach. So there was a big rescue operation happening at the time, undertaken by Frontex, which was the, uh, it is the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. So once you go out across the dividing line, you know, the halfway point between Turkish and, and, and into Greek waters, they would pick you up. Um, but if you if you got caught by the Turks beforehand, they would take you back to the the Turkish side. Now, I, I want to point out that that's changed. And what's happening now actually is that, you know, the Frontex, the world's attention has moved on. and Frontex is not there anymore uh, in, in the same way. And the Greek Coast Guard, rather than rescuing refugees, um, have been conducting illegal pushbacks where they'll, they'll catch people and they'll take them, force their boat back at gunpoint. Uh, to Turkey, uh, they even caught people on the island and put them into boats and rafts and pushed them back. People drowned in the course of this. So the situation now is, is much worse, but we were fortunate that there was a rescue vessel, a Norwegian rescue vessel there um, when we when we got in trouble. And you get on the, the vessel and then you end up going, sorry, spoiling a little bit here of the book. Um, you go, you end up going to Moria in the camp, but I think, I think now it's worth taking a step back and talking about some international law and some definitions of a refugee and a migrant. I was wondering if you could maybe talk about how the traditional definition of what a refugee is doesn't necessarily fit into neatly into everyone's circumstance. I think it's important to look at the history behind the legal definition, which is in the 1951 Geneva Convention. And that was created in the context of the Cold War. Um, it was a time when the Soviets and their allies were actually boycotting a lot of UN activities. And the definition that they arrived at, at this conference, was really designed specifically for communist dissidents. A lot of people were thinking of World War II, the mass displacements, but the definition of the 1951 convention is for someone who's fleeing persecution on an individual basis. And rather than someone, you know, just escaping from war or some other catastrophe, right? Uh, so it wouldn't cover a lot of people who escaped uh, their countries in World War II, the mass displacements. Um, it's designed for a specific kind of person, that, which is essentially the Cold War dissident. That's, that's what the US explicitly was pushing at the time. And the history of how refugees have been treated has really been tangled up in the Cold War. You know, you had the U.S. response to Hungarians, and you know, in the 1950s, or the people fleeing, you know, the collapse of South Vietnam in the 1970s and 80s. They were welcomed a lot more generously because they were interpreted under the lens of you know people fleeing communism. And today, obviously, there's a whole different set of politics at work. Today, this 1951 definition doesn't really apply to Afghans who are just escaping a country because of the war or because of famine that's happening as a result of the collapse of the country's government. And of course, it doesn't apply to people who are displaced by climate change or other ecological catastrophes. And it's really, it's really a category, this distinction between real refugees and economic migrants, it's really a category that the the West, you know, imposes on people and that they then try to have to fit themselves to rather than any existing that distinction that, that's out there in the world. And one of the things I read about in the book is the way that migrants, refugees have to navigate these legal systems. Right. And and one point that you make is the importance of stories to migrants and how they really have to craft their own personal narratives what what was that like witnessing that you know when you're in line at these refugee camps? Well, you hear people talking about their cases and their and, and their stories. Where they're asking each other what they should say. It's very important to present the right story. You know, like you could have an Afghan farmer who flees 
a part of the countryside that's, you know, being hit with airstrikes and where the Taliban are forcibly recruiting his sons. But when he gets to Europe and people ask, you know, why did you leave? The asylum officer asks, why did you leave? And he might say, you know, because of the harvest failed and because of hunger, you know, that was the last straw. But that's the wrong story. You know, that, that puts you as an, paints you as an economic migrant. So migrants try to share knowledge and tactics in order to navigate, you know, the asylum bureaucracy. Of course, the asylum bureaucracies are always evolving to try to defeat those tactics because they're really, they're really responding to supply and demand here. The more migrants that, that came to Europe, um, for example, during this refugee crisis, you could just see the acceptance rates for asylum seekers dropping. I mean, they became less deserving somehow of protection just because there was more of them. You you spent a lot of time at, at Moria, and I'm wondering who runs a refugee camp like Moria? What What is sort of the coalition or the single entity that's in charge of, of something like that? There's this concept in academia called of a, a assemblages, which are, you know, kind of complex constellation of different forces where actually no one's in charge. And that's exactly what Moria was like. It, it, it was a rigid, it was a very ad hoc situation. And you had essentially the European Union intervening uh, and, and overriding Greek sovereignty, forcing the Greeks to put their own like, you know, EU asylum uh, officers and Frontex officers in charge. They're essentially running the show, even though this is on Greek sovereign territory. But then you also had humanitarian agencies, groups of volunteers. There was a, there was a lot of um, Christian groups that had come to Moria that had been attracted by the, you know, the, the televised suffering that they'd seen. And these groups actually, when a lot of the traditional humanitarian agencies stepped out because they didn't, they were refused to work in a detention camp once when, when the Greek camp transitioned from just kind of temporary reception areas to places where people were being detained, you know, place, uh, doctors at borders, for example, refused to work there. So then you had these Christian volunteer groups stepping in and they were kind of running the camp. And we, we had some, you know, girls from the Midwest who gave us our tent and were like deciding where we lived when we got there. So that was very much the strange assemblage that you had in Moria in those days. You also write about in the book, the hierarchy of basically countries of peoples whose asylum cases are processed. I was wondering if you could talk about that. So the hierarchy had Syrians at the apex. Syrians were seen as the real refugees, and they were the most likely to be granted status. Uh, they're almost guaranteed, in fact. Th they were also given priority for a lot of resources, like accommodation. Then next you had Afghans, who were sort of grudgingly accepted. That's that's changed now with the Taliban taking over. But at the time, it was sort of like, well, we're spending all this money on your country and your democratic government. so. Do you really have a reason, uh, justification to to flee? Uh, and then further down, you had countries that were considered like, you're an economic migrant until proven otherwise. Morocco, Pakistan, countries where, that, where people could actually be deported fairly readily. And the, one of the interesting things was the way that the migrants themselves internalized this hierarchy. In a place like Moria, there is a bitter competition you know, for, for scarce resources, for food even, right? Uh, the inmates are pitted against each other just by scarcity and, and, and by the chaos. I mean, it was, a, it was a brutal situation, deliberately so, because these camps are deterrents for people to come. And the migrants, you know, would, would internalize this hierarchy and, and you would have Syrians saying, well, you know, we were the ones that they opened the border for and everyone else just kind of rushed in and Afghans would, present that, but they'd say, well, we're not like Pakistanis. We actually you know, have a have a war in our country and, and so on and so forth. And that that was the that was in many ways the the tragedy of the camp um, was the way it dehumanized people. Not everybody of course. There was also a lot of, of solidarity and, and, and people helping each other. What was a, a typical day like in the camp? How much agency did you have over your own day even? Well, if you wanted to eat from the meal tent and you wanted to use the bathroom, then most of your day was spent waiting in lines. You know, you had to line up early. 
for meals. You weren't allowed to leave the camp for the first, you know, the period that you were in, you're on the island. But migrants found ways around that. You know, there was holes in the fence that you could sneak out. There were, you could, if you could have some, if you had some money or scrounge some up, you could go out and eat in town. We would leave often and go into, into the port town because migrants were allowed to leave the camps once they completed their initial registration period, but they weren't allowed to leave the island. But we would go into the port town and hang out on the dock with some other migrants, swim. You know, it was, it was a Greek island, so it was kind of beautiful. And, lay around in the sun and, and the ferry top dock was right there. And so another way migrants had agency was they could try to get onto this ferry somehow. There, there was a lot of controls, but you could either, if you looked European, try to get, get by without your documents being checked, or you have fake papers, or you could, if you were really desperate and up for it, try to sneak into one of the trucks that boarded. So get up in the undercarriage or hide yourself in the cargo, obviously extremely dangerous. But that's what they would, we would kind of lie around and discuss and scheme about all day. And what was the relationship like between the migrants in the camp and the local population that, that lived on the island? I mean, I think it was it was sort of like um, that line in, in Steinbeck, you know, the people in the tied houses felt pity, then fear, then hatred for the migrant people. It's an old story. And the fact of the matter is, is that the, the people of Lesbos initially had a lot of compassion. Um, they were helping rescue people as they came ashore during the crisis. But once their island got turned into a prison, um, once the world attention moved on, once you know the, the 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 toll of having to deal with the kind of fallout from these these camps, um, from tourism being on, on the decline, you have to remember Greece was, Greece was going through a brutal economic crisis at this time, and and still is in many ways it really soured the mood and we could see rising tensions. We could see rising hostility. I want to take a a step back. How did you write this book? I mean, I imagine if you were undercover, you couldn't really like, you know, take out a note pen and and pad and start writing things down. I mean, did you write this from, from memory? I'm just curious how that went. Well, that was actually easier than I expected. I had gotten a cheap Samsung burner smartphone before the trip. And I would take notes on it, but everyone else was, had a smartphone and they were typing away on WhatsApp or Facebook. So it wasn't very remarkable for me to be writing stuff on my phone. So I would write down notes as often as I could, you know, every night. And then I would, when I had access, email it to a kind of dummy email address, like relay it. And then I would delete it from my phone. So I was able to accumulate 60,000 words of notes over the course of the trip doing that. Like you said, you you did this trip in 2016, wondering how would someone who is trying to make a similar journey now, like we hear about the refugee crisis out of Afghanistan now since the government's collapsed, what what does their trip look like now compared to yours in 2016? In many ways, it's similar. I was on the Iranian border um, in October. I was working in Afghanistan and I drove from Kabul to Nimroz is after the fall of the country, the Taliban. And there was a new wave of Afghan displacement happening. People were in you know, record numbers crossing through the desert. Um, many just were trying to go to Iran to find work because they were close to you know, starving. But others with the intention of going further to Turkey and eventually Europe. So it, the same route they're using, but the level of violence that they're facing at the borders has increased especially on the Turkish-Iranian border, is a lot harder to cross. And again, that's been with the encouragement of the European Union, which has paid Turkey money to strengthen its border defenses and, and keep refugees there. And it's a good reminder that in, until very recently, until this summer, basically, the West was actively trying to keep Afghans out and didn't want Afghan refugees. And, and still, it doesn't really. I don't think if you look what's happening both in Europe and, and with the U.S.'s own evacuation process now. When you were writing this book, I imagine you were finishing it uh, sometime in the past year or two as Afghanistan was, the Taliban were, were rapidly taking over and it became clear that there, there might be a refugee, a uh, massive refugee crisis. Was there anything that surprised you while you were writing this book and sort of watching the events unfold in front of you? Unfortunately not. It just seemed like, you know, 
like I was I was seeing the same process happening, uh, you know, a, a mass exodus, it was a, a new wave. I mean, I was as surprised as, as most other people by the speed at which the Afghan government collapsed. And I went back in June when I essentially finished the book. And uh, very quickly, the Taliban were at, at the gates of Kabul in August. And I ended up staying, you know, through it until the fall, the report on it. And it was, so that was a bit of a surprise. But but the trajectory of the government and the war was was pretty obvious, you know, at the time I started writing this book in 2000. 16 when we made the journey um so it was really you know it was hard to see but i was glad that omar got out you know i think i think there's there's no question that he made the right decision what do you think the most commonly misunderstood part of the migrants journey is having made it yourself well i think people don't realize how deliberate this violence is you know when you have millions upon millions of people who are desperate to leave their country when you have such stark inequality, you know, where part of the world is living in relative comfort and other, another part, of, you know, can't feed itself. Then you're going to have desperate people. And, and the only way to really deter them is, is violence, is force. And it'll never stop all of them, but you, you, can, you can keep ratcheting it up and that's what we're doing with our borders, but it's deliberate. It's deliberate, you know, and it's, and it is necessary, in fact, if we want to preserve the current system that we have, um, a system that we are all, in an essence, complicit in, that we benefit from here in the West, uh, and it's very difficult to imagine an alternate world. But if we don't, then, then, we're, then we're complicit in what's happening, um, what people are going through at these borders. We're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer is Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. You should become a material supporter of Lawfare. You can do that at our Patreon page, patreon.com slash lawfare. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.